have your Bible, go ahead and open it up to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, we're going to be talking tonight about what we need to do with the Word of God. What place should it have in our life? What um, importance uh, should it have in our life? Should it shape us? Should it guide us? Should it uh, help us or lead us into being a people um, that are obedient to what God wants for us to do? So we're going to be asking that question. What is the importance of the Word of God to me, to you? Um, what does it do in our life? What, what does, how does it shape us or how does it mold us? That's what we're going to be talking about. Um, if you go over to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, um, we might look at 3 and 4, but I want you to remember that God is a God of communication. Going all the way back to the beginning, God has always communicated with His creation. Um, he has spoken to His creation. He has written to, I think of Adam and Eve in the garden, He speaks to them. I think of uh, talking to Moses when he's up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments and they're written down. Uh, God has always spoken to His creation. To his people. And that hasn't changed since the day that Adam and Eve were in the garden to this very moment right now. And when we talk about God speaking to us, in Hebrews 1, in verse 1 it says this, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. So God is communicating with us, right? God is giving us the information that we need. And the author of Hebrews says, God's been doing this since the beginning. He did it through the prophets. And now when it comes to the New Testament period, which we're living in right now, this is the final time of dispensation. This is the last time frame that's going to be. There, there'll be this is it, the Christian dispensation. Eternity comes next, that's it. So it is the last days. We're in the last uh, time period. And so he has spoken to us by his Son. Um, he came and he delivered to us that which we needed to know as a people who are living under a new covenant. Okay? A new covenant. So the Bible tells us that God is a God of communication. He speaks to us. The Bible also assures us that the Word of God, the things that He has revealed to us, that the Word of God is powerful. In Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, it says this, So, as much as is in me, I am ready to preach, the, preach to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Paul says, I'm going to communicate. Paul says, I've got things that I want to come and that I want to say. And he bookends all of that with the understanding that he says, listen, I'm ready to preach. I'm ready to come to you. I'm ready to share the gospel. In fact, he says that I'm ready to preach the gospel to you. And then he gives us an understanding of why that desire is there. He says, because it's the power of God. This is verse 16. He says, because it's the power of God to salvation. And then the application of that is for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. That's for everybody. The, the Word of God, what He has said, um, the, those, those um, New Testament principles that we've been given are for everyone. You remember the law was isolated to the nation of Israel. The law was isolated to a people, to a nation, that God rose up so that He could work through in the world. But that's not the case today. Today God works through the, the church. Today God speaks to us from those that um, uh, text that now gives us the fullness of, of, of His revelation of salvation, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We have the fullness. No, nothing else is held back from us. Everything's been given to us. The promise that started in Genesis chapter 3 is fulfilled um, at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right? The victory that comes through Jesus. The, re, the forgiveness of sins that come through Jesus. All of those come to a head. All of those things that were promised under the old law, are fulfilled in Christ in the new covenant. So we have an understanding that God is a God who speaks.
speaks to us. He wants us to hear the things that He's saying. Now, what do we do specifically with the Word? We have to handle it somehow. We have to deal with it somehow. You know, there's an old saying, um, having a Bible is great, but having an, having an open Bible is even better. And that's true. Um, just having a Bible doesn't do for us what the Bible wants to do. We, we don't, uh, through osmosis, just because I have a Bible in the house or just because there's one on my bookshelf, it doesn't do us any good. We have to make um, an effort to look into the Word of God and to see what we can do with it, what it's asking us to do. So I'm going to give you tonight several things that we need to do with the Word of God, right? What we need to do in our life with the Word of God. Here's the first one. Um, we need to listen to the Word of God. We need to make an effort to be a people who say, what is God saying to me? What is He speaking to me through His Word? And am I making an effort to hear what He's saying? In Romans 10, in verse 17, Paul says this. He says, So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. There's, you, you just don't magically get faith. It doesn't just magically come upon you. Faith comes when we are people who are hearing the Word of God. That power that it has, that we looked at in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, the power of God, the power that it has comes when we are a people who understand that in hearing the Word of God, it develops a faith within us. You, you don't inherit your faith for somebody. I, I know there's, there's denominational teaching out there that, that implies that you can just inherit the faith, and it goes all, but that's not true. Faith is a personal option that each person must make. Uh, somebody can't make it for you. Um, faith is something that we have to do on our own. We have to develop in our life on our own. Well, how do we develop that? Like I said, it wasn't given to you. It wasn't passed down through the generations. Paul says, so then faith comes by hearing. Well, hearing what? He says, hearing the Word of God. Do you look for ways to hear the Word of God? Now think about it. We hear a lot of things every day. We're bombarded by, by things that are being said. But are we able to be a people who push those things aside and say, okay, right now I want to know what the Word of God says. I want to focus on us. So Paul says that's how our faith is developed. So we need to be a people, first of all, that listen to the Word of God. Number two, if we're listening to the Word of God, we are hearing these things, then we need to trust the Word of God. The, the things that we have heard, the stories that have been told, the commandments that have been given, the promises that are made, when we hear those things, we need to develop a trust. Let me give you some examples. In Mark 16 and verse 20, Paul says this. It said, or excuse me, Jesus says this. Uh, and they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying sign. I'll come back. Romans 15, 19. It says, In mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. You can see in Mark 16 and verse 20, and you can see in Romans chapter 15 and verse 9, that there is that understanding that the Word of God can be trusted. We can trust the Word of God because it's been confirmed to us. How? Through signs and miracles. Those people in the first century, when they went out, they preached the gospel and they proved the truth of the gospel by the signs, by the miracles, by the things that they did. And so you have the word um, that was confirmed by the miracles, right? Those things that were accompanied by it. And if you look again at Romans 15 and verse 19, it says, In mighty signs and wonders the importance being placed here on this confirming the Word of God, right? In mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, okay? So that from Jerusalem and round about, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Paul had that understanding as an apostle who had that miraculous indwelling of the Holy Spirit that confirmed to him that the things that he was saying were from the Word of God. Well, the things that he preached that came from the Holy Spirit were confirmed as being true by the signs and the miracles that accompanied them. And that's what you see in Mark 16 and verse 20. 
when it said these things are going to follow you. When you go out and preach the word, these are the things that you're going to see and that are going to be manifested in the preaching of the Word. So when we see those things, and what a blessing we have today, we go back, we look into our New Testament, and we see the preaching of the Gospel, and we see the signs and the miracles that took place at the preaching of the Gospel, which confirmed it was the Word of God. Now, today we don't have miraculous indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Today we don't have people going out, preaching the Word, and confirming it with miracles. I know that there are people out there who say they can perform miracles. They're lying to you. They can't. They can't perform one single miracle because they do not have a miraculous indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So they can't do it. So the understanding is that we can trust what the Bible says because when we go back, we look at men who were filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Who were given that ability to say, to show you that what I'm saying is true, a sign is done, or wonder is done, or a miracle is done, and that confirmed the Word. So today, we look back into the Word and we see, yes, I accept this as the Word of God because look what accompanied the preaching of this. Look what took place when this gospel was being put out there. It was supported. It was confirmed by the miracles that took place. So we can listen to the Word of God, and we can trust the Word of God. Here's the third thing. We need to read the Word of God. And I'm separating that from listening. And I'm making the understanding that we need to read the Word of God a very specific individual activity, right? Where one makes a conscious effort to say, I'm going to be in the text. I'm going to be wrestling from the Word of God. And you have this in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. Uh, Jesus says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. And it's followed up, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We need to be students of the Bible. We need to be reading what it says. It gives us that when we read the Scriptures, we have what we need to be effective, right? All Scriptures given by inspiration of God, it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now what else does that for the Christian? It's the Word that does that. It's the Word that fills that place in our life. And, and again, I, there's all kinds of different Gospels out there. There are people who put up a tent on the edge of town and they come and say, listen, we've got a new revelation from God and we want to tell you what God has been saying. That stuff's not true. And all those people are doing is they're lying to you because they're trying to take the Word of God and they're trying to twist it. Okay? The Gospel has been given. Paul talked about the fact how it had been preached everywhere. That the gospel went out from Jerusalem and people were preaching it. And, and, and the, word was, uh, the, the church was growing because disciples were being made. And disciples were being made when they understood and embraced the things that God was teaching them through His inspired Word. So we have to make that effort to read God's Word. Galatians chapter 1, go over there real quick with me. Go over to Galatians chapter 1. And we'll go down uh, beginning in verse 6. Galatians 1 and verse 6. Paul says, he's talking about those in Galatia. It's a region. It's not a congregation. It's a region of congregations. Okay, um, the, the one church, Ephesians 4. And he says this in verse 6. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Now, I'll, I'll give you the next verse, but I want you to notice that. Even in the first century, Paul said an individual could look out, hear gospel, quote-unquote, gospel that being, was being preached, and know whether it was right or wrong. He says this, I, I'm amazed that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. That same problem happens this very day. That same problem happens wherever you're at while you're watching this broadcast. Whatever state you're in, whatever city you're in, whatever county you're in, there are people out there who are preaching a different gospel. 
And the only way that you're going to know the difference between the true gospel and a false gospel, because that's what Paul is talking about, that they could identify what the true gospel was, right? Because you accepted something that isn't. The only way is by reading the Word of God. When you read the Word of God, you understand the Word of God. When you understand the Word of God, you make an application from the Word of God to your life, and it becomes binding. So you have this understanding that when I read the Word of God, it's going to help me from being led astray. It's going to help me so that because I know the Word and what it's saying, when somebody else comes along and says something different, it stands out like a sore thumb. I mean, there's no doubt about it. We know it's not real because we know what the true gospel is. Listen, there are all kinds of things on TV where people are, are preaching these false gospels. They are not followers of Jesus Christ. They are not teaching what the Bible teaches. They take passages from the Scripture and they mutilate them. And I say this so that you'll know you need to be prepared. You need to be ready. Because somebody might come to you and bring a Bible teaching... I hear that a lot, a Bible teaching, but it could be the farthest thing from what the Bible says. And if you don't know what the Bible says because you haven't been reading what the Bible says, then you could be led astray. It's that simple. So what do we do with the Word of God? Well, we need to read the Word of God. Here's the fourth one. We need to study the Word of God. Um, we need to be individuals who make the study of God's Word uh, deliberate. Uh, we do it with a purpose. I, you know, I, I hear so I, studying the Bible is essential. Okay, we're going to look at Second Timothy two and verse fifteen in a minute. If you want to turn over there, studying the Bible is essential. Being students of the Word is essential. Uh, taking that opportunity to make sure that we are rightly dividing the Word of God is important. And, and one of the things that you see, and it's, it hasn't started in this generation, it's been for hundreds of years, is you have this idea that there are scholars out there in the world that can better teach you the gospel than what you can learn by going back and studying the word yourself. Are you following me? There are these, these institutions or these individuals who are saying, oh, no, 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 you just can't sit down with your Bible and come to an understanding with what it says. No, you, you have to sit under the teaching of this scholar or that scholar. Let me tell you something, folks. Everybody who reads the Bible, who studies it and makes proper application is a scholar. You don't have to have something hanging on your wall to say that. You, you manifest it in the way you live, by being a student of the Word of God. And it says this, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. It says, be diligent, Paul is writing to Timothy, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Where's the scholar in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15? I'll give you $1,000 if you can find a scholar mentioned in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. But here's what you will find. You'll find a young preacher, a young and, uh, evangelist, where Paul says to him, you need to study. You need to uh, rightly divide the word of truth. You need to be a student of the things that you are teaching and preaching others. There's, there's, there's no school of scholarship. It's a person making the effort to rightly divide the Word of God because they allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. You know the saying. The best interpretation of Scripture is Scripture. You're looking at something that's hard. One of the best friends you can have is a concordance. An exhaustive concordance which lists all the, the words that you'll find in the Old and the New Testament. And, and what you do is you can track down a topic, you can track down a word, you can track down an event, by just using this handy guide, this concordance. And what you do is you can just look through it. Say you're doing a study on baptism. That concordance will give you every reference to baptism that is made in the Scriptures. You go and you read those Scriptures. You allow those Scriptures to build upon one another. If you find that there's a contradiction with one Scripture on baptism, with another Scripture on baptism, the, the, the contradiction is not with Scripture, the contradiction is with you. The, the Word of God came from the Spirit of God. It's right. It's just. There's no contradictions. 
So you get a word like baptism, and you go through that concordance, and you write down every time you see that word. It's listed, and you go to the Scriptures, and you read it, and read it, and read it. Listen to me. If you read everything in the Bible, every time the word baptism is used in the Bible, if you read every single word or every single verse, you have seen everything that the Bible says on that topic. Right? Oh, no, 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 no. See, you need to come over here to this religious denomination because, you see, they've got this better teaching and and they're going to... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I have looked at that topic and I have studied every single occurrence of that word in my Bible. I think I'm able to know what it says. You can keep your scholar. I think I'm good with the Word of God. Now, that doesn't mean that brothers don't help brothers. That doesn't mean that we don't gather together like tonight for Bible study. We don't have the miraculous indwelling of the Holy Spirit that calls to our mind everything. That was for the apostle, for those who were chosen in the first century, to have that miraculous manifestation of the Holy Spirit given to them so that they could do those things to prove the Word of God. We don't have that today. We have the Word of God. So, you know, when people come and they say, well, um, I've I've had this, and where I normally find it is when I door knock, and what I usually find is something like this. I'll go and I'll knock on the door and they'll answer, and they'll, sometimes I'll just close the door, but they'll answer and you'll say, hi, uh, my name's Donald, I'm with the um, Blue Springs Church of Christ, and I wanted to share some information with you about an upcoming sermon series that we're going to have. And you usually, you know, I kind of begin the conversation that way. And then I'll get somebody who says, well, wait a minute. You, okay, I'm, I, I'm familiar with the folks at the Church of Christ. You, you guys are the ones that believe that you, you have to be baptized, right? Yeah, yeah, we teach. Oh, that's not in the Bible. Oh, but no, would you give me a minute just to, just to show you where it's... Oh, no, 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 that's, that's not in the Bible. I, I know what the Bible says. How do you know what the Bible says? Um, do you read it? No, I just know what it says. So you have a miraculous manifestation of the Holy Spirit that's bringing to mind everything that the Bible says. You don't need a Bible study then because the Spirit is telling you. You don't have to study then because the Spirit is telling you. But those people always say, well, let me get my Bible. Wait a minute. I thought you were spirit and dwell. What do you need a Bible for? Or they'll go to the opposite extreme and say, well, I don't need to look at it. I, I just know what I know is right. Well, how? How? Unless you study it. You know, if you believe that, that an understanding, a doctrine that you believe is right, and you cannot support that doctrine from a proper application of Scripture, then you don't have the right understanding of it. You, you follow me? When you make a proper application of what the Bible says about a topic and you follow what the Scripture says, then you're going to have a proper understanding. If you deviate and go into some denominational teaching or you know, some new gospel over here, some fancy gospel over there, or the, the latest book that's been released on this topic, I, I mean, it never ends. But, but what we know and understand is if I want to know what they know, I need to know the Word of God. It's that simple. I need to know the Word of God because that's going to tell me, as a student of the Bible, that's going to tell me whether what they're saying is right or wrong. And I'll be honest with you. When I get people who say, yes, I believe that, that the Holy Spirit dwells in me, and I'm like, okay, well then, you, you just, just start quoting Scripture from Genesis and go all the way. Well, we, you know, I did Well, you've got the Spirit. So we need to be people that study the Word of God. We need to get deep into the Word of God. Number five, um, and I think this is something that uh, maybe we don't think so much about, but there are some things that are available to us that can really help us with this. And number five is memorizing the Word of God. Okay, Psalm 119 and verse 11 says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. I love the imagery. I have taken your word. Right? This is the Old, uh, Old Testament dispensation. Right? Okay? I've taken your word. I've assumed your law. And I've put it in my heart. I know it. I know it. And I've, I've, I've memorized it so it prevents me from sinning against you. 
right? So that beautiful imagery of saying, I'm going to take the Word, I'm going to memorize it, and when I memorize the Word of God, it helps me when when I come into other situations or when I need to understand something better because I've made the effort to memorize the things that I need, to, uh, the Scriptures that I need to know. Okay, So memorization is not as hard as people think it is. It's really not. And if you just take the time and you focus and you read that verse or you read that passage and you go over those scriptures and you go over those scriptures, it'll help you to memorize those things. I've spent some time around people who are actors. And I've seen them on their sets and I've seen them shooting scenes and I've seen them setting up for scenes, and they always have um, what you might think of as a script, the big book, but they don't always have the big book. Sometimes they just have what that scene is, so they just got maybe two or three pages of what the scene is, and what do they do? They sit down there, and they memorize their lines. That's all. When, when, when the camera says roll, all they're doing is taking what they read that they've memorized, and they're giving it back. Well, isn't that a wonderful thing for us to do with the Word of God? to sit down, to read the Word of God, to commit it to memory so that we have it and we know it. And then when we've memorized the Word of God, it helps us to be a people who are obedient to God. So like the psalmist said, so that we won't sin against Him. You've had times like this. You're, maybe you've got to make a decision. okay? And um, it's, a, it's a big decision. And you, well, what, you know, what do I need? To, what am I going to do? And and I, because you have studied the scriptures, because you've committed in the memory, a scripture verse comes to your mind. You say, you know what? I remember over there in First Corinthians chapter five. I remember what Paul said about bad leaven. Am I allowing bad leaven to get into my life? Am I, am I allowing some type of doctrine that's going to grow in my life and produce more and more? You know what? It's because I've memorized that word, because I know it. I can bring it to the forefront of my mind when I'm engaged in whatever that situation is. And that's what we need as a people of faith. Knowing Scripture helps us in times of joy. It helps us in times of sorrow, times of struggle. It helps us in times of uncertainty. It helps us when we want to be a people that praise God. You know, giving God His Word, um, uh, 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 memorizing it, and, and being able to know it and to understand it and to apply it to different things in our life. Memorizing Scripture is not as hard as you think it may be. Here's another thing. We need to, number six, we need to meditate on the Word of God. So, you could put maybe a few of these together, like studying, uh, reading the Word of God and studying the Word of God and meditating on the Word of God um, could really all be subcategories, but I've separated them because I want us to see one specific jewel out of each of those different topics, okay? So when we talk about meditating on the, world, uh, on the Word of God, we're thinking about Joshua 1 and verse 8, where he says, This book of the law shall not depart from my mouth. But you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do accordingly to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Do do we spend enough time um, meditating on the Word of God, allowing it to enrich our life, okay, allowing it to to shape? Maybe whatever a situation is that we're dealing with, or maybe things that we're learning, um, are we doing that that which we can to meditate? I've heard people who have all kinds of ways that they do their meditation that helps them. I know people who meditate on the Word of God in, in the morning when they sit down, their cup of coffee. I know people do it in the evening. There's people that sometimes get away during the day on their lunch break, and they spend that time just thinking about the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God, and certainly what that application is that we're meditating about, right? I want to be a, I want to be a better Christian. I want to be more committed. And you think, I want to, I want to meditate on the fruit of the Spirit. Right over in Galatians, I want to meditate on the fruit of the Spirit, and that helps me to to put into mind what I need to do, what I need to be producing in my life. It's that meditation. It's making that opportunity. Most people, um, when they think of meditation, you know, think of the the skinny guy with the long beard sitting Indian style, and mm, you know, 
No. We're talking about making that time whenever it's convenient for you. Morning, evening, afternoon, I, you know. Whenever it's convenient for you to sit down and to ponder, to think about the Word of God. What is it saying to me? Number seven. We need to obey the Word of God. Um, here's what we've talked about. Let me give them to you real quick. We've talked about uh, what do we need to do with the Word of God? We need to listen to the Word of God, right? We need to trust. We need to read. We need to study. We need to memorize. We need to mediate, uh, meditate. And seventh, all of that should lead us into being a people that obey, right? How can we spend time reading the Word of God and then say we don't have to obey what it says? How can we spend time saying we trust the Word of God, but then not do what it says, right? How can we listen to the Word of God and then not do what it says? How can we memorize the Word of God and then not do what it says? That's not logical. So the Bible teaches us that we need to be a people that obey what God's Word says. And I know that is so hard for some people because they don't want to obey what God says. It doesn't matter what it is. There's all kinds of different topics. People get themselves into all kinds of different difficulties and things like that. And it becomes very hard for them to obey the Word of God because they don't want to change what they're doing. It's, it's that simple. It's no great mystery. I, I'm not going to change because I don't want to do what the Bible says. And you hear people say that stuff all the time. Oh, you're a Bible thumper. I, you know, I don't care. Oh, oh, you're going to quote the Bible to me and say I need to. You know, you know I just the, the, those lives that say I can't be burdened or held back by having boundaries placed upon me from the Bible. I can't do it. And so they don't have a life of obedience. But what's what we're called to be? Look at um, James chapter one. James chapter 1, and I want you to notice verse 22, James 1 and 22. It says this, but be doers, uh, and I'm cutting into that passage. You can back up 22, 20, you, I'm cutting into the middle of it. Um, and it says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. But wait a minute. How, how, how can reading the word of God deceive me? Right? Wait a minute. Um, <laughs> Brother Donald said that I needed to meditate on the Word of God. Well, then how can that deceive me? I need to listen to the Word of God. How in the world is that going to deceive me? Well, notice closely what James is saying there. James gives us this instruction. He says very clearly, but be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. If we don't do what the Bible says, we're deceiving ourselves if we think we get the blessing that comes from being obedient. You, see, you can sit down and read the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation back and forth as many times as you want to. But if you don't obey the things that are written there, then it's, it, it has no merit in your life. It's not enough just to hear, and this is, this is what um, uh, uh, James is saying, but be doers of the Word, right? And not hearers only, if you hear what it says, you have to do what it says. And like I, I mentioned, that's where it gets hard for application for some people because they don't want to do what the Word of God says. They want to ignore it. They want to change it. They just want to you know, put a different spin on it, whatever they want to do. Um, but you can't do that. We have to be doers of what the Word says, not just hearers of the Word. I don't think anybody sets out to intentionally, well, I, mean, I, you know, I don't, don't know the intentions of every man's heart, but... You would hope that, that you know, an individual doesn't start out just to intentionally be deceived, you know. But the problem um, becomes when, when they don't reach the point of obeying what the Bible says, but they deceive themselves in thinking that they have the blessings that the Bible talks about. Let me give you an example. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, uh, baptism is taught to all the people who were there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, right? Peter preached to them death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. He talked to them about the consequences of what took place in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our sins. And when they heard those things, um, they were pricked in their heart. They were cut to their heart. And they said, men and brethren, what must we do? And then the response came back to them from Peter to tell them what they needed to do in their question. That they were asking, he said, you need to repent and you need to be baptized. Right? You need to repent 
and be baptized. You, you need to take this step where you understand that this immersion is being required, right? This immer- baptism, the literal word means to immerse. The, 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 the literal Greek word, to put under, to plunge down, to immerse. And so Peter says, well, what you need to do is you need to be immersed, right? You need to be baptized. Now, it would be foolish for somebody there on the day of Pentecost to stay there and ask that question, well, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter says, well, you needed to be baptized, right, for the remission of your sins. There's a specific reason why you're being baptized. For, it's connecting it, right? Uh, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. They go together. Okay, they go together. You don't have remission of your sins without baptism. And you don't have baptism if it's preached separate and apart from being part of God's plan of salvation. Oh, do it some other time. Oh, do it if you feel like it. Oh, do it maybe, you know, whenever it's convenient. No, listen. Peter said what you need to do is you need to repent and you need to be baptized, right? So if somebody was there on the day of Pentecost and they heard that, and Peter said if you were baptized, you have remission of your sins, and that person didn't get baptized, but he walked away saying, well, I know what the answer is. The answer was you need to be, repent and be baptized. I know the answer. But he didn't do it. And that person goes away and he claims in his life that I've had the remission of my sins. No, you haven't. You have not had the remission of your sins. How can you? You have not been baptized. You ask the question, what do we need to do? The answer was repent and be baptized. That's what you need to do. So remission of sins is not given to one single person in the New Testament and to this very day who has not been baptized. Remission of sins comes when one is scripturally baptized. It's that simple. In Acts 22 and verse 16, Paul was told to arise and be baptized, calling on the name of the Lord, right? You know, I need to arise. I need to be baptized. Paul is told, washing away your sins. That should sound a little familiar because it's essentially the same thing that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. For you will receive the remission. What is Paul told? He's told to be baptized for the remission, the washing away of his sins. So if somebody says, oh, I believe that, but they've never done that, well, they're fooling themselves. This is what, this is what uh, uh, James is talking about. If they're not going to obey the Word, they don't have the promises that are in the Word. And what you get today is you get people who have accepted a false plan of salvation. Okay, They've either said a prayer and they believe they're saved. Okay? or they've reached out and touched the TV screen of some televangelist who's lying to them and they feel that they're saved. Or um, some of these guys, you send in uh, an offering, money. You send in money, and that'll show that you've placed a, what do they say, a, a faith seed. And your faith seed is going to grow and you'll have this relationship with God. It's, it's, just, it's just error. It's, it's, it's fake. It's not true. They're lying to those individuals. They're lying to them, Right? Because if you're not baptized, your sins are not washed away. Acts 2 and verse 38. Acts 22 and verse 16. Romans chapter 3. Begin in verse 1 and read all the way down to the end of the passage. The end of the chapter. So if you think you have remission of your sins and you've not been scripturally baptized, you don't have remission. You're fooling yourself. This is what James says. You're fooling. If you just said, I accept Jesus in my heart, you're fooling yourself and thinking that you're saved when you are still in your sins. Every single one of them. But you don't have to be. You don't have to be. You can obey what the Bible says about baptism. This is James' whole point. Don't read it and say, I believe it, but don't do it. If you read it and you believe it, you've got to do it. Okay? You've got to do it. So that's number seven. Number eight. This is our last one. Um... What do we need to do with the Word of God? Listen, trust, read, study, memorize, meditate, obey, and pass on the Word of God. Pass on the Word of God. We do not want the Gospel, I don't, and I know you don't, to stop with me. The the Gospel was taught to me, was preached to me. I accepted it. I don't want it to stop there. I want to be able to tell somebody else. uh, Peter's one who said, you know, always be ready to give a response. Right? Always be ready to give an answer to somebody who asks you, right? Well, that's passing on the word of God. That person doesn't want to hear what your opinion is, right? I'm a gospel preacher. I, I, I preach uh, uh, two sermons every Sunday, two Bible classes every week. 
I'm preaching over uh, 150 sermons every year. People do not want me to get behind the pulpit and tell them what I think, what my opinion is, how I feel. They want the Word of God. And that's what people deserve. They deserve the Word of God. So we want the Word of God. Who cares what I say, right? Doesn't it matter what the Word of God says, right? It matters what the Word of God... Well, I don't like what Brother Donald said on baptism. Fine. What does the Word of God say on it? What does the Word of God say on it? If you're hearing something different from what I've said the Bible says, well, then you and I need to sit down, open our Bibles, and get to it. One of us is wrong. Right? So we have to allow the Gospel to be passed on. Let me give you some examples of how this happens. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13. Listen. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me and faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Hold fast to this pattern, right? You hold fast to it. You make sure that you have it. We're going to keep going, right? We hold fast to it. 2 Timothy 1.13. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So we hold on to the standard, the Word of God. And then we pass that Word on to others who will then pass it on. Did you catch that? Passing on? Look. Look what he says. He says, uh, commit to faithful, uh, commit among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Went from this person to this person, then to that person to that person. The gospel keeps going out. It shouldn't stop with you. It shouldn't stop with me. I'll give you one more that maybe you don't usually think about um, in, in the context. Maybe you don't always think about the passing on, but it's there. In Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, and I know you probably know them very well, but notice there's a command in here to pass along the gospel. There's a command that is given, right? He says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. It's a command baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That is a command. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. That is a command. There's three commands right there that have to be obeyed in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, and they're, they're, they're being said to those who are faithful New Testament Christians. There's three commands. One of those commands is you need to teach. You need to pass along to others the things that you've come to know and understand and to be true by rightly dividing the Word. Listen, if you're not going to learn God's Word by osmosis. It's just not going to work its way into your head, right? It doesn't happen that way. It doesn't happen by just having a Bible on your coffee table. It's not going to do anything for you. You have to be an active participant in the Word of God. Paul said it's living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces right to bone and marrow, right? I mean, it is this penetrating thing. You know, it's got that power and that authority that comes with it because it comes from the Holy Spirit of God. And it is how... And how could we say... Think, think about this. How could we honestly say something that came from God would not be powerful? How, how could we ever say something like that? Anything that comes from God is powerful, right? Well, tonight we've been looking at how powerful His Word is. Tonight we've been looking at the importance of what we need to do with the Word of God. It requires us, and here's the thing, it requires us to make effort. And if you remember back when I began, um, Christians don't just happen. There's not some assembly line and people are placed on this assembly line and they go through, boom, Christian, boom, Christian, boom. Christianity is not an assembly line, right? Christians don't just happen. People become a Christian. They become a Christian because they're taught how to become a Christian. They're not taught by the will of man. They're not taught by the word of man. They're not taught by the, des the desires of man. They're taught by the word of God. It's what we've been looking at tonight. It's all been about his word. And the word of God teaches how one becomes a Christian. Right? Christians, it's not an assembly line. It's individual for each person. 
When one has reached that age of accountability, that, that age when whatever it may be for that individual, when they're able to obey the plan of salvation, to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized, when they're able to know those and understand those and be able to reason about those, then they're ready to make that commitment. They're ready, right? And they can become a New Testament Christian. You don't accidentally become a Christian. It doesn't happen. You're not sort of a Christian and sort of not a Christian. You're not, well, I'm on the fence. No, let me tell you how simple it is in the Word of God when it comes to a Christian and a non-Christian. You are either a saved disciple of Christ or you're not. You're not kind of, sort of a Christian. I'm real close to being Christian. You're not a Christian. When you have obeyed the gospel plan of salvation, you become a Christian. Just like those on the day of Pentecost. Just like uh, Paul in Acts chapter 22, right? Just like Cornelius in the book of Acts. Just like the Philippian jailer in the book of Acts. Just like the, the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts. They became Christians. And it all centered around the Word. There is not one example in all of the New Testament. And I hear people in, 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 the, in the denominations who they just get this so wrong. So wrong. There is not one example in all of the New Testament of a person becoming a Christian without first being taught. Matthew 28, remember 1920, teaching them to observe. There is not one example in the New Testament of a person being ignorant of what the Word says and becoming a Christian. You don't, but you hear these, it doesn't, you know, you turned on your TV and you're feeling down and they're, they're playing, right, these, 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 uh, and the televangelists, these TV preachers, they're playing. It's 2 o'clock in the morning and they're replaying this worship service and they're pleading with you and you know they're working on your emotions and you're already as late at 9 and things aren't going good and they're playing on your emotions and they say, well, all you need to do right now is accept Jesus in your heart and you're saved. And bam, that's what that person does. That person's not a Christian. That person doesn't even know what the Bible says on how to become a Christian. This idea that you can be a Christian and be ignorant isn't taught in the Bible. This is the whole point that we've been talking about, friends, with the Word of God. That if we don't know it, we can't do what it says to do. If we don't know it, we can't obey what it says to do. If we don't know it, we can't teach it to somebody else. You want to be a scholar? Get your Bible out and read it. That's, what you, that's all you've got to do. Make the time. Take the effort. God made the effort through great struggles and difficulty to bring His Word to His creation. Great struggle. Great difficulty. Many people gave their lives in the preaching of the Gospel so that you and I could have it. You think that was all done casually by God? You don't think that he didn't have a plan and a purpose for all that to take place? Well, sure he did. This idea of casual Christianity, I don't know where it comes from. This idea that you can be an ignorant person on what the Bible says and be a Christian, that don't come from that didn't come from the Word of God. That comes from people who are cheating you and taking your money because they're not giving you the truth. It's that simple. Now here's where we're at. All right, here's where we're at. We, we looked at all these things. I gave you eight. We looked at all these things, and we asked, what do we need to do with the Word of God? And we looked at all these things. Now the question for you is, what are you going to do with it? I, I, I don't do it for you. You don't do it for me. The question is, after all of this, what are you going to do with the Word of God? You have to have some response. You have to be willing to do something. If you're not willing to take effort, if you're not willing to have action, then it's James all over again. One and twenty. You're just fooling yourself. Listen, God went through great, great struggles to get the word, His word, out to His creation. We dishonor God when we dishonor the word of God. That's true. And I know. A lot of people don't like that, but that's true. When we don't rightly handle the Word of God, that power of God under salvation, right? When we don't rightly handle that Word of God, we're disrespecting God. We're dishonoring His Word. And we're fooling ourselves into thinking that we're a people who are blessed when we're not. 
What are you going to do with the Word of God? Choose wisely. Let's have a prayer. Father, we're thankful that we've been able to come together this evening to open our Bibles to study what, Father, you've revealed to us through these inspired men, through these men who were led uh, by, the, by the teaching of the Holy Spirit as, as this word was revealed to them and confirmed by signs and wonders. Father, we, we, we've had a great privilege to be able to look at your word tonight and to read it and study it and to make application to our life. Father, it's our prayer that we remain in your word that we remain students of the body of uh, that we remain students of the bible and father if we don't know something we'll go look for the answer in scripture if we don't understand something we'll go look for the understanding in scripture father we want to do those things that build up that honor and uphold the word of god father we thank you it's in jesus name we pray amen Thank you for tuning in today. I really appreciate it. This was our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, We will be back Sunday morning at 1030 right here. We'll be on what you're watching us on right now, either OABS or on our YouTube channel. And we will have our worship service at 1030 a.m. this Sunday. Listen, take take the time and tune in and and join with us um, as, as we have that opportunity to worship God. Thank you for watching tonight. I appreciate it. God bless.